there was a um, Tibetan Lama from maybe, I don't know, a few centuries ago. And this was a few centuries ago, right? He said, the problem with people is these days is that, you know, they're, they're so easily offended no matter what is said. In my guru's time, you know, my, uh, my guru was like uh, a rock. And no matter what you said to him, there'd be no reaction, right? So now, if that was a few centuries ago, how is it now? I think we're very thin-skinned. We're very sensitive. We can't take any kind of criticism. Is it? I'm this way. So we work on it. We work on it first by noticing that this is there, right? And then, well, we slowly come to, to change. That's all we can do, you know? But part of it <coughs> is also getting to think differently about criticism, right? Because normally we think that criticism is uh, a bad thing and intrinsically bad. But actually, this is uh, also dependent upon how we look at things. At a very fundamental level, then, you know, once we start talking about bodhicitta, we start talking about the wish to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. What that means is, you know, a, a Buddha is enlightened, is, is perfect in every way, right? So, criticism can be a good thing if we look at it from the perspective of if we want to become perfect in every way, we need to find out about our faults and then work on that. Normally, it is very easy to see other people's faults and it's very difficult to see our own. So when people criticize us, on the one hand, they could be telling us things about ourselves that we don't notice, right? We might be doing something, and, um, well, we don't notice that it's a fault. We don't want to look at it. So it can help us to identify things that we didn't work on. That's a good thing. In fact, there are many great uh, sports, sports people who will, you know, work with a coach and they'll videotape the golf swing or the whatever, you know? And then frame by frame analyze and then see, oh, see here, your weight was too much on your left side. So, you know, oh, here, you gotta open up your hips more or whatever it is, right? And they pay a lot of money to be pointed out these faults. And they're very glad when that happens. So, maybe we can also learn how to do that. Think about criticism in a different light. But <clears throat> the other situation when the object of, uh, well, the, the subject of the criticism about us is actually not the case, it's unjustified, right? Then it gives us another opportunity. Because it's in those times when we're, when we're um, criticized unjustly that this strong feeling of, wait a minute, I didn't do that. And that, that kind of I, that, that strong sense of ego, it comes up. And in the traditional texts, when they talk about meditating on emptiness or ultimate reality, the first step is to identify the so-called <coughs> object of negation, to identify the sense of the I that doesn't exist, actually. The I exists, you exist, but how we exist and the way we innately sort of think we exist is not the same. And in these times of being accused falsely, then that is when this sense of the exaggerated eye comes up the strongest. The other instances are 
when we're in a busy crowd and we get like kind of pushed around, yeah? And from my own experience, it also manifests very strongly when people jump the queue in front of me, okay? That happens a lot in my experience here. <laughs> So those times that you know we get, uh, we have a great opportunity to then practice, practice emptiness, practice, uh, you know. The great um, Christian saint uh, Francis of Assisi, mm -hmm. you heard of him? Mm -hmm. My guru tells this story all the time, but apparently. He would have dinner parties, and after, after the dinner, he would then ask everyone around the table to criticize him. Yeah. Amazing. We normally, you know, want to be praised. Oh wow, this pasta is so good. You know, can I have the recipe? But he wanted to be criticized. He asked people to do that. So, again. Just loosening the spot that the criticism is 100% bad from that side and seeing if we think about it in a different way, then, um, then our reality has changed, you know? Uh, so that's one thing. Now, <clears throat> the other thing is, and this is what I've been dealing with a lot, I was talking to Venerable Samson about this. But, you know, I just have come from Dharamsala, where I did these intro courses with a hundred people. And I would get these, like, notes. It, the course was in silence, right? So I asked the people to write notes, questions that they wanted to clar clarify clarification on. But sometimes, rather than questions, I would get these like love notes <laughs> <clears throat> that would um, express things that I'm, you know, doing wrong. So, I, uh, yeah, a few years ago I would take this very, 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 very personally. Now I'm taking it just very personally. <laughs> so, uh, the, practice, the practice does work. <laughs> Maybe in a few years it'll be okay. But uh, what I came to notice, you know, it'd be, it'd be very interesting educational because um, although we had this policy of silence, right, then <clears throat> everyone wants to ask a question in the lecture. And then, if especially the, the two people right closest to me would do that most. And then I would hear them. And then, you know, in the, in the Bodhisattva vows, there's one vow that you, you have to answer a question that is asked with faith or, you know, ask sincerely, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm in this dilemma. I'm like, damn, I heard their question. I have to answer it, you know? <laughs> so I would answer it. And then... Uh, then I would get notes, right? <laughs> Some people are like, you're answering too many questions, you know? <laughs> like, just keep to the silence, what are you doing? <laughs> and then there'd be other notes that were like, you know, it's so great that you're actually answering the questions because if we just do it with the notes, we can't get into the dialogue and that actually is not best for our learning. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Then, okay, so that was one thing. Anyway, there's others. Some people found my, uh, I was taking a little bit of a, how would you say? Hmm. I try to tell stories that are um, illustrative of uh, concepts in the Dharma and also happen to be, what I think, somewhat entertaining and funny even. <laughs> How well that works, I'm not sure. 
But <clears throat> because I did a bit of learning, okay, I studied about the, the science of learning. And the point is that you, one remembers a story a lot better mm -hmm. than just hear the, you know, the 16 uh, yeah. elements of the Four Noble Truths, right? <laughs> we have a lot of this in Tibetan Buddhism, okay? But, and actually this is a little tip for all of you, they say in a, if you go to a job interview, right, then whatever question they ask you, try to tell a story that illustrates it and you'll be much more memorable anyway. So <laughs> I'm viewing this as like my kind of Buddhist job interview with all of you. And I'm trying to get hired to lead you to enlightenment kind of thing. So I don't know, I try to make it memorable for you. Well, not you, but you, know, you on the broad sense. And the other thing is up there, you know, there's a hundred people and then some, they're like, you guys are all very nice, but over there, like, there's people, like, literally lying down in the session. I'm like, what? You know? And some people are just totally blank in the face, and I'm like, oh, my God. Like, it's just like, there's one person even there, they just were like this. <laughs> For like for like fifteen minutes. <sighs> anyway, what I came to just the first few days, I was getting so discouraged. But then later, I was like, hmm, you know what? It's like the bell curve, right? Mm -hmm. In any population, there's going to be the 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 outliers, right? <clears throat> and so many times, you know, people's reactions isn't about you. Right? But it's about them. And, well, <laughs> what this shows is, you know, if we expect something, right, then when we get it, then we're not so surprised, you know. So even, like, expecting that, you know, there'd be, say, 10% of the people that are going to take what we say out of context or take it the wrong way or take it personally, then it's okay. Oh, wow. Hi. How are you? Great. I was just talking about you. No. <laughs> <laughs> he actually, he's actually just came from Dharmasala. And uh, he's in one of these courses. He was talking about you. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, you know, there was a there was a saying that like, um, you know, if you don't want to be criticized, then the best thing to do is nothing, right? Do nothing, say nothing, be nothing, and then you know, no one will criticize you. But if you're happy with that, then like what? Then you just stay at home all day. But if you want to make a difference with you know, in the world, then you can't please everyone. And actually, um, the former Secretary of State in the U.S., Colin Powell, you hear about him? Mm -hmm. Colin Powell. He said, you know, actually getting everyone to try to like you is a sign of mediocrity, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, it, it's, it's better to kind of, you know, not waters things down, but do do something big, and then there's going to be some people that really like that and appreciate it, and that's great, you know. Um, you know, I was a used to be a musician. Did you guys know that? No. Anyway, um, I f uh, yeah, I used to be a musician, and there's this this site where independent musicians could put their music online, and this was before downloading, right? You could then buy CDs of independent musicians, right? And then so some people, you know, you could say like what your music was like, hmm? and then there'd be some kind of indie rock bands, but they would put that their music is like Britney Spears and like, you know, Christina Aguilera, these very popular ones, 
right? And if you do like that, then, you know, the 16-year-old girls that buy CDs a lot, they might do a search and then find you and then maybe buy your, your CD like by mistake once, right? <laughs> right? But the point is, you know, there's a big diversity of people with different interests, you know? And <clears throat> excuse me. And there's one um, one article called A Thousand True Fans. A Thousand True Fans. I think the person who wrote it his name, his last name is Kelly something. Anyway, a thousand true fans. It's still online. But his point was like, you know, if you're a musician, you might have a very specific niche. And then in the world, you could find a thousand people that will love that kind of music that you love to make. Right? And so don't try to be everything for everyone, but find your thousand true fans. And these ones, you know, they will, um, you know, they appreciate what you are doing and then they will, you know, buy your CDs and, and that will be enough for you to have your uh, music career, right? So I think that's very wise. The other thing I was thinking in such a big group, so I was talking about what I've, what I've learned from my last month up in Dharamsala actually. Um, and responding to the criticism and all this, and, and how I try to bring it into my practice. But the other thing is, you know, like it doesn't matter how many people don't get it, but rather focus on how many people do get it, you know? Because, well, it's true. In one of these intro courses up in Tushita, even the, the um, spiritual program coordinator told me that most optimistically, like 10% of the people might be still involved a year later, right? But most of them, they'll go to one 10-day course and then bus, you know? So, <coughs> rather than, you know, watering down some message and like walking on eggshells and not saying anything that's going to challenge anyone because there's a lot of people that had problems with like past and future lives, karma, this kind of thing, right? So one thing could be to, you know, like brush that under the table and just keep everyone happy, you know? But is that really benefiting people? And especially those, that 10% that it are going to really take off with it then should give them the sort of full spectrum of the teachings or, or for whatever it is, you know. There was uh, one of my favorite quotations from Zongsar Kensei Rinpoche. You heard of him? He was talking about spiritual teachers today. And he said the problem with spiritual teachers today is so many uh, you know, they're afraid to give the students what they need and are too focused on giving the students what they want. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, especially what we're trying to do in the our developing ourselves, it's uncomfortable. We're going to have to look at things inside ourselves that are not nice to look at. And with any kind of skill that we're trying to do, it's like, you know, when you learn to surf, if you ever do that, then for the first several months, it is not fun at all. It, it sucks. Paddling out, I, I never would have thought, but it's so hard just to paddle out on that board. You know, your, your shoulders get so sore, and there's all these waves that have come, and they knock you back in halfway to shore. And like the first few times I went surfing when I was you know, young, it would take like an hour just to get out to where the waves are, right? And then you're tired, and then like you try to catch a wave and you fall down, and then, you know. The other, the other more experienced surfers, right, they get really pissed off at you 
because you're like taking their wave, you know? So anyway, it's the worst thing to actually learn how to surf, right? Or what do you guys do here? You know, you ever notice that? When you are coming up the learning curve in something, it's not fun, you know? Or playing tennis or golf. Maybe even golf, even when you're good, like, it, it's, it's horrible. You hit one shot, shot off into the woods and it's like, why me, <laughs> you know? Anyway, so um, the point is, what we're trying to do here, we're gonna have a lot of those moments, right? We're gonna have, you know, there's one saying that the, the spiritual path is just one mistake after another. <laughs> I think Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche said that. And there's another saying, it's better to, it's better not to even start. <laughs> but once you start, it's better to finish. You know? Anyway. My point is, um, hmm, what is my point? <laughs> when we come to see how, uh, you know, the real learning comes from making mistakes and then being able to analyze what happened and then improve on it, then we can come to see criticism in a totally different light. Mm -hmm. The second point is, those people <coughs> that are criticizing us, okay, well, one, we shouldn't care about everyone's opinion as much as we do. Because first of all, a lot of people, they, um, they're not qualified to judge or critique us, right? It'd be one thing if, you know, the Dalai Lama came and heard me give a talk on Buddhism and then the Dalai Lama was like, hey, you know, I'd be like, okay, let me take those notes, <laughs> right? Because I, I care about, this is someone that I look up to, I care about his opinion, I want to know how I can improve. But other people, all right, everyone has their own opinion, but do we want to give people the power to, uh, you know, criticize us, and then, like, that is so important, their opinion matters so much, that it then, you know, totally brings down the rest of our day or makes us, you know, doubt ourselves. Mm. And then just also understanding that you can't please everyone and in every crowd, no matter what you do, there's going to be some people that like it, there's going to be some people that don't. And so it's not about you as a person, but it's just the life. And then also thinking, Right, that although um, because of that, because of that diversity in individuals, you should focus in your own mind, remember, on the positives. And these 10 people really get it, and that's my intended audience, and I'm gonna work for them. A few times, and Shanti knows this, um, Shanti's my, my boss in Bangalore, center, the director, a few times I've said to you, I've had it, I'm going to quit. Right? Remember this? Because of various antics from the people down there. I'm almost like the boy that cries wolf, you know? But every time I think, okay, okay, yes, there are these few kind of troublemakers, but overall, there's some benefit there. And so if I just quit because a few people are doing some inappropriate behavior, then the other people are going to suffer and they're not going to get the benefit. So I dust myself off and I continue, you know? And this point is actually um, very, very important for us as we start to think about ourselves as Mahayana practitioners. Because the, the main thing that will, Mahayana, you with me? Yep. Mahayana means the motivation for our spiritual practice is to attain full enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, this mind of bodhicitta. <clears throat> and 
The main obstacle to that is when we see how difficult living beings are, we then develop the thought, oh my God, how can I ever liberate, how can I ever benefit these people? They're so unruly, you know? And we can fall away from the path. You guys know Shariputra? Shariputra was the main disciple of Buddha. And you don't have it here. <laughs> but normally when you, when you, sometimes you'll see Buddha and then on either side there are two kind of monks standing up. Hmm. Anyway, when you, when you do see that, it's Shariputra and Mogalayana. Oh, in the back there. Yeah, there, you can see. Anyway, Shariputra and Mogalayana. And it is said that Shariputra, okay, they became arhats, right? They became arhats, they became liberated. But we make a differentiation between mere liberation from samsara and the full enlightenment. Okay? Um, anyway. Let's, let's not get into that. Remember, we're not getting too philosophical today. But in any case, Shariputra in the past had been a Bodhisattva. Okay? Now, when he was on the, the just at the beginning of the Bodhisattva path, someone came to him and asked for his hand. Cut off your hand and give it to me. Okay? So, he is a bodhisattva. He's trying to benefit sending beings in every way he can. So he actually does. He cuts off his hand, right? Cuts off his right hand. Then gives it to the person using his left hand, which in India is a big no-no. So the person he cuts off his right hand and gives, tries to give it, the person he's giving it to gets outraged. How dare you pass me something with your left hand? Yeah. Can you imagine? <laughs> okay, you know, first, you've cut off your right hand. Do you understand the story? <laughs> this person had asked you to cut off your right hand. And then you, you give it, and he's outraged. How dare you do that? So Shantiputra, at that point, is like, oh my, how can I ever, how can I ever benefit any beings if we're going to be like this? Right? Which is a fair question. <clears throat> so he says, okay, forget that. Because, you know, attaining enlightenment, it takes a long time, it takes a lot of effort. And he's like, okay, I can't do it. I'm just, sending beings are too difficult. Therefore, I'm just going to attain personal liberation for myself. And he did that. Which is good, but we're trying to strive for something more. Right? We're trying to strive for full enlightenment so we can be of utmost benefit to all beings. And so, this thought of being discouraged when we see others' bad behavior is the main obstacle to that, that can cause us to fall away from the Mahayana. Hmm. So what is the solution for that? Just being aware that this is an obstacle, or is there any remedy? Well, no, this is, this is the remedy. Right? This is what we're talking about. We expect, right? What do we expect from sending beings? You know? Love. Huh? Mm -hmm. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is the problem. I'm amazed uh, when we put that there are politics against somebody like you. Uh, it makes me accept uh, politics against myself as a professional so much more easily. <laughs> <laughs> wow, then there's benefit to sharing that. <laughs> yeah, I, so this is, this is the thing, right? There, there's one saying that our satisfaction in life is our, is reality minus expectations. Mm -hmm. 
Get this? Do the math. <laughs> right? So what that means is the, the more expectations we have, right, then reality, <laughs> you know, is not going to ever meet our high expectations. So if we have low expectations, if we don't expect love from sending beings, but we expect criticism, then we're cool. You know, I, I came across, I'm doing this, um, uh, sorry, I know I'm in India, I love India, but <laughs> as a traveler, the first several years, right, I would just get ripped off all the time. <laughs> it's like the tourist tax, right? So then I met some, um, some other travelers up in, in Dharmasala who were interested in Dharma. And we were talking one day, and then this thought came, someone was telling me this. It was like, you know, she said, when, when I travel, I just, you know, budget in, I make it in my budget, 500 rupees, I'm going to get ripped off this trip, right? <laughs> you put in your budget. Then it's like, okay, here, auto rickshaw ride, okay, I got ripped off 50 rupees, okay, cool. Okay, this one, okay, 60 rupees, right? Then when you get to the destination, it's like, oh my gosh, I've only been ripped off 310 rupees. <laughs> Bonus. And it's like, wow, 190 rupees, I'll go get a nice you know, meal or something. You know what I mean? Then it's like happy, right? If you set expectations low, they are wow, right? See what I mean? So part part of the, part of the thing, and and I think this is another benefit of reflecting on the uh, suffering of samsara so much. Then, when we experience something, we're already kind of expecting it.